Okay, so tonight on Guitar Night Live, I'm Daniel Jacobson, in case you don't know me. I run the Ultimate School of Music, and we do these webinars every Saturday night with a guest guitarist who we I talk to and I interview them and I ask them about their whole journey with the guitar, and uh, they play a bit for us, and you can ask them questions. That's the idea. So we're going to proceed tonight with our guest, Hugh Buckley, who was one of my first teachers, actually, in jazz when I was about 15 I think I started going to this Wednesday night jazz improvisation class at New Park and uh, he was teaching on that so I remember walking in one day and seeing Hugh there and I remember one of the first things Hugh said to me was oh he saw I played the guitar and he said oh what kind of what guitarist do you like and I said uh, George Benson because at the time I was really into George Benson and uh, Hugh said, oh, George, I was in New York last week. I was playing with George. So I was like, whoa, that was like unbelievable for me. <laughs> Do you remember that? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a while ago then, obviously. Yeah, that's... Um, that was in the 90s, yeah, 94. No, yeah, because I remember a couple of times I was over in New York and went to hang out in George's house, all right. So, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that was really cool, yeah, yeah. How did you get to meet George? Um, it's through David O'Rourke, actually. You know David O'Rourke, who's another jazz guitar, Irish jazz guitarist who lives in New York. And, and there's a friend of his, um, Celino Clark, who's a Hammond organ player, um, who knew, knew George from way back. And um, he brought us out there. And uh, well, we had a great time out there, yeah. Cause, yeah, yeah, because he was one of the reasons I I first got into jazz music, you know, really, uh, or jazz guitar anyway, yeah, yeah, when I heard you breezing that album, you know, that album, Breezing, yeah. Breezing. I loved Breezing, listen to it so yeah. much. That's great. And actually, it, it's a great in for people as well, that album, like, you know, into that sort of music, because it's, it was very melodic, and it was, you know, kind of poppy and things like, you know, but it's, uh, yeah. Amazing guitar ranch, yeah. So that's that, that's funny, all right. Amazing production and the whole thing, the sound of it. Yeah, it's a good album. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you, how did you get into guitar in the first place? Like, did you? Why did you choose the guitar to play? Did you play any other instruments before that, or was it just yeah. first stuff with guitar? No, um, it was guitar uh, from the beginning, um, and I I started relatively late i was 16 i think 16 or 70 but i think it was 16 actually when i got my first guitar and uh i mean like prior to that like i come from a, a family where there's loads of music around the house and um so so even though you know i hadn't played an instrument before you know there was a lot of music in my head i think you know like a lot of people um I was always a music around the house. Like my dad played like a few instruments. He played in you know, the bass actually was his first one, I think. Um, and he played piano and fiddle and mandolin and whistles and things like that, you know? So he, uh, he would encourage the interest in music. But, uh, but I remember when I bought the guitar actually, actually I was only thinking there today when I was thinking about that because I, I kind of thought you'd ask me that question, you know, <laughs> obvious question. But, um, I bought a guitar from a friend of mine, actually, who was selling a guitar. And actually, I had a, I'm not sure whether, whether, if I had a bought the guitar, if I had not a bought a guitar off him, I wonder would I have gone on to play guitar after <laughs> I don't know, actually, to be honest, you know, you know. But um, it was obviously something I wanted to do anyway, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, so I started playing and I was self-taught. There was no, no one around giving lessons or anything like that, you know, at the time in my area anyway. And of course, there was no internet. Um so so most of the learning in the early days was from listening, you know, to cassettes and or or uh or vinyl. Yeah. You know, slowing down the vinyl or and trying to hear the phrase and then trying to learn it back and you know. And then and then a few friends, you know, showed me a few chords as well. So, you know, so yeah, just yeah, so that was the start and then what kind of what were the records you were listening to then? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I was into I was into 
all the popular music of today, I suppose, you know? Yeah. This would have been the 70s, you know, you know, so um, I liked, you know, soul music. I liked the um, Deep Purple and Santana. They were sort of guys I would have been listening to, you know, a lot of as guitar players. Um, and then I was listening to oh, Yeah, sorry? Were you playing electric guitar at that point? Yeah. It was, I don't know what it was, that guitar now. Like, I sold it fairly, fairly quickly after that. Well, I'd say after about a year. But I think it was a copy of a, a Fender Telecaster. But I don't even know what what the name is on it or was on it actually on there. I'm gonna have sorry, I sold it now because it'd be nice to kinda have that now, you know. <laughs> and then and and then I bought a Les Paul um an Ibanez Les Paul copy then I remember. Oh right. So quite a rock guitar. And I changed the pickups, yeah. I put a DeMarzio pickup in, you know, but yeah. you know. And um Yeah, yeah, I mean that gave me the sound I wanted at the time. Because uh, fairly quickly, actually, um, I had these few friends who were playing locally, which is very, you know, lucky, really, because, you know, a lot of people don't have that. And um, and we started a little band, you know, in the garage, in, in my dad's garage at the back, you know, as as people do, you know. Yeah. Okay. Like, I remember uh, my cousin, actually, who was playing drums, and, like, his first thing was just, he got drumsticks first, <laughs> and then he played on the table and stuff like that, you know. It was, it was, uh, it was very simple. At, you know, at the beginning, but each week we really get into it. And then he, and then he bought a snare drum and, you know, and it built up, you know, from there. And we, we'd rehearse all day, every Saturday in the, in the early days, you know? Yeah. So, so that was something I really got, was looking forward to. And then I, I would practice every day you know, during the week and try and have that, a new song or something every week, you know, that we could, you know, try out, you know? And what, what songs were you playing there with the band? Oh, um, Funny enough, I try to write our own music then, right straight in at the deep end, you know. Right. It, it was probably uh, because we couldn't play other stuff really in a way, you know, you know, because just had the basic few chords and, you yeah. know. Um, Can you remember any of your tunes that you wrote then? No, no, I know. Um, it's, it's a long time ago. Yeah. But um, there is a cassette around and actually I must, I must, you know, get it out. There is one. Actually, there is a cassette of recording we did then a yeah. few years later. Yeah. But, you know, that would have been a long time ago. You know, that would have been sort of late 70s or 80s or something like that. And we did. And, and uh, yeah, we, we went into a studio and, and recorded a few original tunes. Yeah. And were they songs like you had a singer? Yeah. I, I even sang on oh, right. one of them. Yeah. <laughs> no, I never heard you sing before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I kind of have, sorry, I gave up singing, actually. Yeah. I blamed the jazz thing on that, you know. Right. Did you never sing in jazz gigs? <laughs> no, no. All right. But, um, what was the music like to, at that point? Was it like rock kind of music? Yeah, yeah, it was rock music. And sort of funk and soul, you know, yeah. you know, that type of thing. Sort of, you know, I remember getting those chords, you know, the, you know, the minor seven chords. Yeah. You know, all those sorts of all that sort of stuff, you know. Cool. You know, beautiful at, at that point, were you into soloing on the guitar, or were you playing like mainly chords? Yeah, I was trying to solo. Solo. I was probably all one pentatonic scale, and yeah. probably not very melodic, you know. But I was, you know, trying to create as, you know, what I could with the materials I had there, you know. Um, you don't forget there was no internet around, so you couldn't really check out. Oh yeah, totally different. You know, you know, ways of doing things, or even fingerings and things like that, or anything like that. You know, but yeah. Uh, Were you trying to, like, work out solos, like guys yeah. in Santana and stuff like yes. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was well, remember yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, come on, Remember that one? You know that one? Yeah. It's kind of on an A A minor thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember much of that, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah. You know, you know, because it was very melodic and, and a lot of the stuff wasn't too fast, you know, so you could get it together, you know, which was good. Yeah, so that was a great help. Yeah, Santana. Mm. And, uh, did you, so how did you get from there to getting into jazz? Did it take a while or was it gradual? Yeah, it was a gradual thing. Um, yeah, I suppose I became okay at doing what I was doing, like, um, and I was out there doing some gigs then, you know, we got some gigs and I was out gigging, like fairly quick, you know, um, 
And actually, it was good in those days because you just get paid for gigs, you know, <laughs> unlike a lot of young people now, sort of, yeah, starting out and um, it's difficult in that sense. But yeah, yeah, maybe we got paid. I mean, you know, probably not a lot. Probably got paid for every gig, you know. Yeah. Was was it around Dublin or did you yeah, go yeah. around Dublin as well? Yeah, community centres and school halls and things like that. You know that that sort of thing was still around then. You know, I'm not sure whether that exists now, like too much really. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah, that was good. That was a, yeah, that was a good start. So, so, so eventually, um, I started listening uh, to other things. I remember hearing Steely Dan. Then that was one thing that put me in that direction. You know. Yeah. I mean, I was aware now. You know, my family have a jazz background. Obviously. Yeah. My uncle Dick and my dad actually, you know, had an interest in 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 jazz music as well. I mean, he introduced me uh, to Charlie Parker as well and earlier around that time, and it didn't really stick with me. You know, it all sounded very ambiguous, and yeah, you know, and you know, as it does to a young guy playing rock music, you know, in the beginning when you hear all this stuff, you know, there was nothing really to latch onto, you know. So, so I heard Steely Dan, and obviously they have a very much of a jazz influence, like harmonically in particular, you know, all that. So I was listening to those chords and I really liked the sound of the chords, you know? So I started checking out some things like that, you know? Um, and then and then I heard Breezing then, yeah. I heard that album. And then, and then another thing um, on RTE TV, one evening I saw Joe Pass um, solo in concert. And that was a revelation, like seeing this guy they play like an orchestra with one guitar, you know? And uh, yeah, so I got a few of his records and, and my dad really liked him as well. So he probably encouraged me to, you know, listen to some of that stuff, you know, so. Um, and at that point when you heard Breezing and you heard Joe Pass, were you, did you, did you like find anybody to get lessons from to learn some jazz or yeah well, this is, yeah, yeah this um and the kind of the only lessons i had actually then really you, you know except one-off lessons along the, the way but um tommy hafferty who you know well yeah yeah of course yeah yeah tommy he was doing a gig with my uncle my uncle dick you know richie and michael's dad in town and um he mentioned that to Tommy that I was uh, I was interested in that. So I went out to Tommy out in Bray, you know, I was living out in out in the north side, you know. So it, it was a long journey in those days out in the bus, like, like two buses out. But I went out to Tommy and um and I had some lessons with Tommy, which was great. You know, so he introduced me to extended chords, you know, you know, fat fives and yeah and some things like that, you know, and um so so I got stuck into that, yeah, you very quickly. Yeah. But, um, I know it took me a while to get into that sort of thing, you know, to get any sort of thing happening with that. To be honest, I hadn't a clue what I was doing in, in, in the early stages. Yeah. You know, and I was getting the odd opportunity to sit in with people and I really hadn't a clue what I was doing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, but then eventually just listening to players, you know. Yeah. Listening to Louis Stewart then, that was a great thing. I went along, obviously, then at that stage, Louis Stewart was playing in town every week and I went along to see him every week. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was a real education, you know, because you know, here was somebody, a local guy just playing at a world-class level. Sure. And, uh, and Louis was really on fire in those days. He was really like, you know, and um, yeah, so it, it was inspirational, you know. And what did, did you like used to talk to Louis and did you ever like yeah ask yeah I did. A lesson or anything or um no no because I I'd heard at the time he had stopped teaching yeah I think Tommy Halfey went to lessons with him and really there's a few other people um who who I can't remember at the moment but uh, oh Jerry Lynch was another guitar player who was around and he he went to Louis as well for lessons then but um yeah so Tommy helped me there you know for a while and he he introduced me to recordings and, you know, and different players, you know. So, so a lot of time when we went out to Tommy's house, we listened to music as well, which is great, you know, just, um, you know, so that was inspirational. And then I could go and, you know, check out stuff myself. And, and then there was a record store in town, actually, a jazz record store in town, which, uh, 
might well have been the only one that ever was actually. Um, what one was that? There was a guy, um, Mick Fagan, and it, it was in the Dandelion Market, where, which was, which is what is now uh, Stevens Green Shopping Centre. Right. And it was a market that was there every Saturday, you know, and he had a little shop in there, and that's where where I think I would have met Dave O'Rourke. And a few people like that, because he used to hang out there, you know, obviously, and he went into jazz, it would have been a, a good hang at the weekend, you know. If there's a live bands playing there, I think you too played up around that time as well, you know, in that place on, on Saturday afternoons. And, you know, there was, you know, all the, all the local bands were performing there. Yeah, so. Wow. Yeah. I never heard of that. Different landscape completely, isn't it? you know, to now though, when you think of it. Yeah. But there have been a few different jazz nights happening at that time, yeah, jazz in Dublin. I think that yes, yes, there was. My uncle actually played one with Tommy Halfie. I was saying that was in the Parliament Inn up there um, in Parliament Street, up there, yeah. um, off Cable Street Bridge, and then and then Louis had one um, in Slattery's then, uh, which is in Cable Street up there, um, and then I remember Jim Doherty had one up in the Harp Bar, which is on O'Connell Bridge there. Yeah. You know, a big building there, it's, yeah. I, I don't know what it says on it now, but he used to say harp, I think it might be Heineken there or something. But it, it's, um, he had a gig in there with a, with a group called Spawn. I think it might have been Rock Tetter. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, or something. Yeah, yeah. remember what kind of, what were you playing then? What were you learning in terms of jazz tunes? What? Um, well, all the, yeah, all the ones that guitar players were playing. Um, remember uh, Wave? Oh, yeah. And that's fairly complex, that tune, isn't it? You know, wave. I play a bit. Of it. Um, I don't, actually, I don't really. Um. actually a blues actually it's a kind of a blues with sort of major sevens and things like that actually the structure is actually a blues you know so you can hear the melody there you know the end part of the melody is kind of blues so that um morning at the carnival was one yeah you know, yeah that one um yeah so there would have been latin ones because i like the sound of them because they have nice melodies you know all that sort of stuff you know no appeal to me and i think it does generally to a lot of people at first when they hear these nice melodies and mm in that Brazilian music. And then um, Sonny, the tunes like that, Sonny. And yeah, I love Sonny. Pat Martino had a great version of that at the time, I remember. Yeah. So um, I had that, I think it was on a live album, he played Sonny and it was, yeah. yeah so been was trying to work out Pat Martino's solos over no. No. <laughs> <laughs> They sound like something on another planet. Yeah. Um, as did Louis Stewart to me at the time as well, like, you know, really. Um, yeah. And at that time he had been listening to Martino, I think, and he was playing a lot of these little long lines, you know, uh, you know, really extended long melodic lines and they, were, they went on forever, you know. And yeah. Very fast tempos and, you know, so, yeah, just trying to ease the way in and, yeah. Did you play jazz gigs then at that time? I did eventually. Eventually, um, well, I got sitting in with people. And then um, Bob Hyland, do you know Bob Hyland, the, the singer? No. Um, and Ray Dempsey, who's a harmonica player. Hmm. And there was Ian Hyland. He had these, these guys had a regular gig in uh, Tinnaman's Bar. I remember down, I think it's William Street down off Grafton Street there. And they had a gig every week. And I was able to sit in there sometimes and, and play like two tunes, you know? Cool. And that was a, I mean, that was a way in. Uh, then, oh. yep. Yeah. Someone's asked, can you play Sonny first? I, want, I was going to say that too. Yeah, Niall was asking, can you play Sonny? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say, um. Something like that. Do 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 do
I think probably Tina did something like that. You know, for the tour around, which is nice, actually. Actually, I must have, must have a look at that tune again. Yeah, yeah. Very really nice. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice tune to play. Yeah. And uh, sorry, I interrupted what you were saying. That was okay. Yeah, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, I was just saying, yeah, there was a few opportunities around. Oh, yeah, sitting in with um, the You had to play, like, sit in, because people would let you sit in. Yeah. You know, and around that time, I remember there was a lot of gigs on Sundays. Yeah. I think on Sunday, Sunday jazz, you know, you know, we used to joke about that, you know, uh, you know, that you only play jazz on a Sunday, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, it was a gig on a Friday. No, you can't do that. You can't play jazz on a Friday or off a Friday, as you say in Dublin. But, um, but yeah, yeah, there are opportunities like to sit in and play a few tunes. Um, I remember um, Sax Hotel, uh, there was a guitar player, uh, Mark Chapman was his name. Yeah. He was a really good guitar player who played like like Tal Farlow and players like that. And um, he was great and he was very kind, you know, to let people sit in and, you know, play a few tunes on the gig. You know, so it was a few opportunities like that, um, which is good. And I think that's probably a bit of a less, there's less of that going on now, possibly because I think a lot of people have their own projects now doing original music. Mm. And um, in those days, that wasn't happening much. Um, I mean, like the where people obviously playing playing original music, but 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 a lot of gigs, especially those Sunday gigs, and I would imagine there's about like twelve, fifteen of those gigs around mm. town on a Sunday, which is amazing. Um, you could go in and sit in, you know. But uh, but obviously you know, that was stuff. Now everybody's trying to write their own music and have their own project. I mean, I do it myself, you know. So it's not really a sit in situation, you know. Mm. Although I do notice there's some jam sessions starting up around town, which is. Uh, well, before all this happened, it, yeah. it was anyway. So it's a great thing, I think, really. You know, for people to meet musicians. I mean, how do you meet, meet mm. musicians as well? It's not through schools, actually. That's a great thing. Well, also the Dublin Guitar Night was a great meeting point. Like you'd yeah. cross over of different genres and people meeting there was great. So I think that was important. Yeah, that was a good... Um, I suppose uh, the reason why I set that up in the beginning was as a networking thing for everybody to just kind of meet each other at the time. Because I remember it was at the end of the recession thing when I started, like like the last recession. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, um, you know, it wasn't a huge amount of gigs, you know, and musicians were free a lot. So I thought it might be an idea to get people going. And that was great. I mean, you played at it yourself. And yeah. I think over 100 guitar players played. Brilliant. It was amazing to think that was you know, over a hundred guitar players and the standard was really high all the time. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it started in other places then. I heard a couple of other cities started a guitar night. It was like- That's right, it did start. Um, Galway and London and other places. Had for a, yeah, London. There was a guy up in Stockholm actually talking about starting one there. If the London one is still going though. Brilliant. Yeah. A guy, Chris Woods is the guy who actually got that going. As far as I know, it's still going, actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, that was a good, you know, place for people to meet up. Yeah. You know? but, uh, but I'm saying for people, like, starting to play as well, like, you know, it's difficult to meet people, really, in a way. So that's where schools are, are great. I think it's one of the uh, main benefits of being at a school as well, I think, actually, is... Uh, is meeting like-minded people are just people who have a passion for music you know absolutely yeah, isn't it? it really is you know working and meeting people it's very important yeah yeah i mean what you're doing there is a great job it's it's fantastic i think you know thank you because you know i did you know a couple of weekends with you there um and the year things i think there were probably and um it was just a great atmosphere and and people are all levels of playing and all ages and you know it's just all under one umbrella it was just great 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 vibe to it you know which is great just, you know it's such a like valuable thing you know uh yeah we yeah i totally agree it's like it's, it's, it's why we do it <laughs> we love it yeah but uh remember i was i was inviting you to their student performance that Aoife doyle played in the yes class. yeah the we put the videos up recently from that and this sounds oh, cool. great. And Aoife sounds great, of course, Aoife's amazing, but 
Yes, she is. All our students playing there, you check that out. That's yeah, yeah, we'll do, yeah. Look for our students. Yeah, yeah. But uh, before I ask you another question, I just want to say to everybody, if you have a question, you can either put your hand up. There's a little button where you can put your hand up and I'll see it and ask, and then you can talk. I can unmute you so you can ask you a question or you can write it in the Q and A. If there's a question from Sandra, I'll uh, ask you that in a few minutes. And uh, so there's a couple of ways you can ask a question if you have one. Uh, to just bring it back to where we left off, we, when you were kind of in the scene then and going to see Louis and playing some gigs on sitting in on Sundays, at that point, were you, were you making a living off playing music? Was that like you were a guitarist then? Um, I, I was eventually actually, not, not too long after that. I did have a day job actually, you yeah. know, at that stage, yeah. Right. Um, I worked in the Irish Sugar Company, oh, cool. which was a semi-state company, which I went into, yeah, so the, um, yeah, kind of an office job, yeah, just do so, but I was good at the time. But then, um, yeah, then, uh, I'm not sure what year that was, but um, I think 89 then that ended then, and uh, I was starting to get some, I was starting to get a good bit of work around that time, you know? And you know, you know, sort of, you know, got playing on the scene, and I had my own regular gig in Slattery's Den as well. Ah, on Thursday cool. night, I think Louis was on Friday, and I was on a Saturday night, you know. Ah, so um, you the up and coming new Louis at that time, were you? Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> I was just trying to do my own thing, but it was great. I mean, that that experience was great, and like I would have been using like Louis's rhythm section and all that. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I think maybe Stephen Chell might have been playing at one stage actually there, but he, Peter Ainscoff it was a great drummer as well and uh yeah then uh, john wadham and um, you know yeah. so i got to play with all these guys and dave fleming on bass yeah you know, and there uh, so so it was great to play with all these guys because to me these were the guys like you know with all yeah. the you know out there doing it and uh yeah yeah it was a great learning thing you know and yeah so that was a kind of like you had a day job and then you was it like a dream to be a professional guitarist and do that well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it took me a little while uh, to get going on that because I think in my early days, I never thought you could do it as a, you know, a, as something you could do, you know, uh, you know, whereby you can make a living yeah. you completely playing music or true music, you know. So um, it took me a long, long time to come around to that sort of, you know, thinking that maybe I could, you know. But, uh, but I remember Richie, um, Richie went off early and the, he cut the tail end of the show band thing actually and he, he played in a show band when was, he was about 17 at the time, you know. We're, uh, we're around the same age, Richie and myself. So, um, and I remember thinking, I mean, that really sort of, I thought that was, uh, well, that's, uh, that's something he can do that. But still, it took me a long time, like 10 years later, you know, where I thought actually, yeah, maybe, Maybe I could do this because you know, don't forget they were the days when people, if you got a steady job and a job for life and that, you know, that was the thing in those days, really, you know, for most people. Yeah. yeah. So what happened? I got a, I got a, I got an offer of teaching um, in Ballyfermot actually. The one hour because David O'Rourke was there for the first year. This was in 1980, I think the the end of 88 or start of 89. Anyway, it was that period. And he was going to emigrate to New York. They, right. And he, he, he put a word in for me and I got the, I got the gig, you know. Yeah. And at the time, that was the first school of its type at all. You know, there was nothing else. There would have been like the College of Music and, uh, you know, very little else, like really, you know, as, you know, a music school. You know, you know that was the rock school, you know, which is still... I suppose called the rock school. I think there's a another name for it now, a, a contemporary music and a, a performance. But um, but I'm still there actually. I still still do that. So so I've made I've made a living like through music, but having having a little teaching job on the side as well, which to you know subsidised, you know the rough times. You know, but I would say most of the time it worked out really well, and uh, and it's been fantastic teaching. Actually, teaching is a great thing in the end. Because it, it forced me, I mean, uh, like to learn music theory and stuff like that, because I had to very quickly learn stuff, you know. Because <laughs> um, I think the idea was, at the school then, they were trying to get musicians 
you know, from the industry, you know, you know, people from the industry who are actually doing it as opposed to teachers at the time, music teachers, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, so, so I think a lot of people would have been probably brushing up on those skills and trying to learn what's what, you know? So, so um, I had to study that. And then at the time I was studying the jazz thing, so I was learning some theory anyway. I was trying to understand how chords worked and harmony worked and, you know, looking at some scale sounds and things like that, you know, really. And would you, would you have been writing your own music? Like, and um, at the beginning, no, no, I was just, I mean, uh, like the jazz thing, when I get into jazz thing, no, no, would have been, you know, trying to play standards and just trying to make some sort of sense of them and to try to play them in time. <laughs> yeah, because one of the difficult, the difficult things playing jazz actually really is the tempos as well when you start playing. Yeah. Like you're trying to get the, a grasp of certain language and that, and then, then it's been played at a really fast tempo as well, a lot of the time, you know? Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, so that was difficult. So, uh, yeah, I, I was just constantly trying, you know, trying to get some repertoire up, you know? Yeah. Did, um, there's a question that Sandra asked earlier, actually, how do you approach writing a new tune? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose everybody has their own way. I, I'm not a prolific writer, but I have a good, you know, book of tunes there, yeah. you know, that I like to play um, over the years. And I haven't been writing much, of late at all, like, you know, but, but usually it was very simple for me. I wanted, uh, you know, some sort of a groove or some sort of a, you know, type of a tune. Mm. They might be a swing tune or it could be a Latin tune at the time, or it might be something in five, four, or it might be, you know, and then I go about thinking of something, okay, what, you know, how could I work on that? I might have a melodic and um, a melody um, and then harmonize that. Most of the times the melody I have actually really, yeah, and um, and and I like strong melodies because I came from like you know the pop thing. Yeah. So really, I like really strong melodies. And do you find melodies by playing them, or would you? I sing them and then try and yeah, and then yeah. you know try and fingering on, on yeah. the chord and you know really yeah 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 it's, yeah it's a pretty organic way to do it actually, and I think it's possibly the best thing really because if you're trying to get your fingers to write a song, you yeah. know it's not the best way you know really. You know, and you, you're just playing patterns or you're playing things that you know and things that you've done. Yeah, big time. But if you're just singing a melody, so I might be singing a, something. And then, and then once you have that little germ of an idea, then, then you develop that then, obviously, you know, and have another section or another section again in it. And, you know, you know, and it, yeah, you just develop that, you know? So, uh, yeah. Around tunes that you can play a bit of. Yeah, I don't, well, uh, well, I don't actually, yeah, yeah, funny, all the tunes I write uh, really are for groups, and yeah. I often think of the instrumentation as well. Yeah. You know, um, like at the moment now, what I'm doing at the moment, actually, I haven't been playing a lot of guitar, actually, I've been sort of trying to write arrangements for a new project of pop songs from the 70s, because uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's something I've been meaning to do for a long time. Right. Um, so I've sort of eight tunes roughly sort of around range there now you know you know over the over this period it's a chance to do that you know and I really enjoy, I'm really looking forward to that I mean it's going to be an organ organ and, and guitar type thing you know with drums and maybe a horn and maybe not you yeah. know so those things and some nice grooves so so I'm trying to take you know pop tunes from that era and, and just um make them my own a little bit you know yeah well, um, um, sorry yeah, which ones? Yeah, when I say arranging, yeah, I reharmonize them maybe and put some rhythmic things into them and uh, cool. maybe change the phrasing a little bit. And yeah, yeah, I mean, just trying to make them my own. And um, like I always felt actually, even though, you know, playing jazz standards and all that, they're amazing tunes and the whole lot, you know, but really, you know, that was from another era, really, like before me. And um, like, like songs that really resonate with me. Like I still play a lot of that like 70s stuff. I'd put it on and listen to tunes and, you know, uh, particularly that early, I love early 70s sort of music, you know, and because the, you had the charts in those times, you know, you know, like the top 30 in those days were just a mix. Like you would have Deep Purple and yeah. then you'd have Johnny Cash and then you might have a novelty song or something and then you'd, you know, uh, 
you know, James Taylor folk thing, you know, and uh, you no, know, all different styles all in there. Where where now it's you know it's completely different. The you know the chart thing is very different now. So 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 there's a lot to work from there, really. You know, um, so you know, things like the Isley Brothers and things are doing and uh, yes, uh, Arnold just mentioned there. He is a question you mentioned strong melodies can you remember that harmonized version of my girl you worked out ages ago oh who, who asked for that i know oh anil yeah hi anil yeah oh that's an old friend of mine actually anil yeah she he recorded one of the tracks on that album it, it was called spirit level actually we recorded up at his place actually a long, long time ago um and um, no i don't anil <laughs> <laughs> i actually don't actually remember it actually <laughs> but it's on that album yeah but I remember I had a few different hits and the harmony was completely different yeah. um, I don't know it might be on YouTube I'm not sure where it is actually maybe it's not there's a couple oh, more questions there uh, I'm sorry I'll have to go over that in that mad and yeah I'd... <laughs> <laughs> Joshua asked have you got any tips for implementing thirds and sixths into your playing Um. I, I, I don't really have a system for doing it, but um, it's good maybe at first, maybe maybe get a scale and just play a scale and, you know, that sort of thing. You know, um, you know, that's, you know, six or, or, or thirds, trying to get, you know, you know, go up the scale. So harmonize the scale, just use your ear to do that really. Um, there's probably a lot of materials on that on how to do that. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah they're very valuable things for soloing as well, you know? You know? Um, sounds lovely, A minor, you know, just, and that's just basically A minor scale. Using the interval of a third, you know, you know, you know splitting up in thirds. Um, yeah, so and six then are obviously the real standard sort of you're using soul music. Like Steve Cropper played a lot of those things actually in the in the soul days, you know, those sort of things. He made that his own style really and all those things. All those sort of things, you know. Um which Jimi Hendrix picked up on that she as well. He would have been influenced by them by you know, people like Steve Cropper and that, yeah. Was Jimi Hendrix a, what, did you listen to him a lot? I did actually, but it, I never, I, I think I only really copped onto him uh, really when I get into the jazz thing, you know, so so it didn't seem as relevant at the time. Like years later, I listened a lot more to yeah. Jimi Hendrix and yeah, I love, love the vibe he's playing. It's really about the vibe, isn't it? And just something special there, like, you know, really going on, you know. Um, but it would have been interesting, interesting I see there, only recently I've seen um, there was some he had tapes of him with some jazz musicians and Larry Young, a great um, organ player who played with Grant Green and all. Um, Jimmy Hendrix was doing some stuff with him around the time he passed, you know. And it would have been interesting to see where he would have went with that. Yeah. And so it's like you know, really interesting. But yeah, uh, but what he's left behind is amazing body of work, anyway. It's, yeah, big time. You know, I think and, more yeah. than more than anybody else, when I've asked people, why did you start playing the guitar? Because of Jimi Hendrix is like by far well, the yeah. most common thing of, of Yeah. Guitars. Well, I, um, well the way I, way I play guitar basically was because I wanted to do music eventually, you know, I did. And the, and the guitar seemed like the thing. Actually, actually my sister played um, play the piano. Yeah. No, my younger sisters, you know, I, I'd be the eldest in my family. And, um, my sisters all played, but uh, it kind of didn't appeal to me, the piano at the time. And so uh, I suppose in a way, probably the guitar was a cooler thing, you know. And yeah. in particularly in those days, er every song had a guitar solo in it, you know. And yeah. That's what, we're all, that's what I always listened to, you know. So it was, um, I'm kind of sorry I didn't actually play piano in a way now, but, you know, there you go. <laughs> Another question here from uh, Philip earlier, he asked, do you ever any plans to re recreate the five guitars? What's the five guitars? I'm not sure what that is. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was the thing I was I was probably coming to next actually when you were asking me about you know my aggression getting into the jazz thing. And 
in, I think it was 1987, um, I got a call from Louis Stewart. It was amazing. Um, at the time, that was the first time he ever called me, actually. And it was great. Um, I, I remember answering, oh, oh, actually, I think my mother actually answered the phone and she said, Louis Stewart is on the phone, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, what the hell is this, Louis Stewart, you know? You know, um, yeah, God is on the phone. <laughs> Not quite. But uh, he, um, he, he was telling me he was forming this five guitar group. Um, and he was going to start it in a few weeks' time. You know, he asked, so he was asking, would I be interested? <laughs> so, um, of course, I said yes straight away, but there was some reading involved, and I couldn't read a note. <laughs> and I didn't say that. <laughs> so, actually, for that month, actually, uh, before we started rehearsing, I tried to, you know, get some reading skills together, you know. And they were very basic, you know, but... Uh, um, um, but I went along with it and eventually, you know, was able to play the parts anyway that I was doing, you know, you know, and, and in the tunes. And, and that band consisted of uh, he, Dave O'Rourke, you know, Dave O'Rourke, who's in New York now, and um, Mike Nielsen, Louis Stewart, um, and Bill Brady, who was another guitar player, a friend of, uh, of Louis, Louis Stewart, um, had a school down in Walton's actually. I used to teach guitar there for years. Um, that sounds amazing. I've never heard of that before. Is yeah. There any recordings that I, of that? I think there's a clip on YouTube. It might be from the Late Late Show or something. We did one of those shows. Um, and it's the five guitars, yeah. Wow. Um, and we used the rhythm section, bass and drums as well. You know. Um, so, yeah, so basically that was like like a horn section. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, five different voices, you know, and um, and Louis, Louis wrote most of the arrangements, but I remember Mike Nielsen and Dave O'Rourke wrote some really nice arrangements too. At that stage, that would have been beyond me actually writing anything like that, being able to do that, you know, you know, I hadn't really like thought about anything like that at all, like, you know, because everything was really self-taught, you know, except going to Tommy and learning some chords and things like that, mm. and they, you know, they, it was all self-taught and, uh, and say no internet or anything like that at the time. So you you picked up bits of information, any bit of information you had, you you tried to apply it, which is uh, which I think is a great lesson actually, because I think a lot of time, you know, this is the age of of too much information maybe in a way, you know, yeah. and you get overloaded with information, and then you end up doing nothing in a way. Where if you just have one little thing, someone says to you, okay, okay, I'm going to incorporate this and make that work for me, you know, so. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, 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 so that was the five guitars. And then, um, no, I've never thought of resurrecting that. And um, of course, Louis passed away since then and Dave lives in the States. And yeah, I mean, there are other guitar players here. And I don't know where those charts are. Um, it should be something I should look into really. Um, yeah, yeah, because they're really nice charts. And, and I mean, it's some really nice gigs. We played at the Opera House in Cork at the Jazz Festival, you know, you know, we did nice gigs. And um, uh, Neil said about the uh, My Girl chart, he said, good thing I kept the charts. So, um, oh, really, did he? Oh, that... God. <laughs> <laughs> you have so, to send me those, Neil. It's <laughs> so another question from Thomas in Cork City. How do you approach chord melodies? And also, Thomas and anyone else who had trouble getting in, the link wasn't working for some people initially, initially tonight. Sorry about that. Apologies. Glad mm -hmm. you could make it. You got in now. Yeah. So, how do you approach chord melody? And maybe you can, you can. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something I love doing. Actually, actually, my hands are a bit cold here. Actually, but um, yeah, um, the chord melody, the most important thing is the melody. I think, isn't it? You know, yeah. um, so so like the first step is always to know the melody and have it mapped out on the guitar. Be able to play it, you know, horizontally and vertically, I suppose, on the guitar. Be able to play it up the neck and be able to play it across the neck as well, you know, and in different places, you know. Mm. Um, and then and then have a set of chord changes, you know, you know, basic harmony at first. And uh, or, or another approach, which a lot of people like to do, and I think it's a very good one, is, is to get uh, like the root note of those chords and the melody. I just tried to play the root on the melody. For instance, say, you know, say you're playing 
somewhere over the rainbow, you know, the melody will be. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, an octave. So maybe I might go uh, uh, Sorry, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then. sort of thing you know if you get a set of chords you know that's a set of chords you know basic chords that I'm using there and then um, and then then try and fill it out then when I have it and then I try and you know get some moving things in inside them I know this is very quick like this, this is something you spend years doing but but I, I get those two notes then So, so, so I'm adding full chords and, and have moving things goes on. Okay, now that's, that's you know, there's an awful lot of work in that. But, but it, uh, the important thing is the melody and have some sort of set of chords that you want to use. And they can be just the basic chords at first and just try and find those things. I mean, that in itself sounds actually very nice, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds, you know, it's very strong. Huh? Yeah. It is, isn't it? What do you think, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's listening. There's more questions coming in. There's that. Uh, okay. Yeah. There's am. Um, yeah. Gigs with high profile musicians. Do you have any fun story you could share? Well, there's, a, there's an old saying what goes on tour stays on tour. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Don't you worry. But, um, I can't really think of any stories straight off that are. But any ones you could say here, or you could tell here. Um, not a great one for telling stories. There's a few other jazz musicians who are brilliant at that. Uh, people like Dave Fleming and yeah, Ronan Gilfoyle. And Richie, Richie Buckley's brilliant, actually. You know? I, I forget all these things. I'm, it's like jokes. I forget a joke. If you tell me a joke now in five minutes, I've, I've forgotten it. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> you can play instead. Well. I want to just mention if anybody missed the beginning, I'm going to upload the recording of this after and you can watch it. We'll put it up on Facebook. So if you want to see the beginning, if you missed it, you can you can watch that later on. Uh, another question. Oh, someone asked, could you play your song Bright Song? Oh, God. Yeah. Bright and uh, another question there. Did Irish folk or ballads influence your work at all? Um, no. And that's the sort of a thing that's been often on my mind because, you know, traveling abroad over the years, playing, you know, as a jazz musician going, you know, from Ireland, I always thought, you know, it should have some Irish identity or something, but I never really sort of, I mean, I listen to Irish music, you know, and I love, there's a lot of amazing Irish musicians I love, you know, and, uh, um, but I've never really, um, I remember Richie Buckley and myself, we went to, went to Argentina about 10 years ago. And we did a tour around there uh, with our friend, um, Ruben Gonzalez, who's an alto player from um, Rosario, you know, which is the second city in, in Argentina. And um, we were playing these like amazing theater gigs like you know it's amazing we went over there it was advertised so well and we were av advertised as sort of <laughs> almost seemed like big stars i remember we went into the square and there was a big drape over this tall building with hugh and richie buckley from ireland like you know on the thing <laughs> it was very strange but um on those gigs we decided we you know we should play a few uh irish things you know and funny enough a lot of Irish people, you know, came to the gigs 
like people who would been like families there for 150 years or something like you know there you, you you'd meet like uh you know Patrick Sanchez there like you know or something like you know you know these guys and they came up to after the gigs but I remember some some guys came up to us after because we played things we played a few things like Danny Boy and things like that you know and just the two of us as a duo you know and I had some nice car voices I can't you know, remember that now myself but um so the people with tears in their eyes you know those Irish people and all so so really affected people and it was you know it was kind of an eye-opener but and you know really yeah but there's so much you have to do in life as a musician. There's so many things, you know. I mean, I, appre I appreciate the Irish music for myself. At the only time I did actually do something, I did, I did a little, um, I was lucky enough um, uh, to produce Ronnie Drew's last album, you know, of the Dubliners. Yeah. You know, it was great, actually. Um, he wanted to do some kind of a jazz album, like, because he, he used to come to our gigs over the years, you know. He used to go to Louis Stewart's gigs years ago as well, I remember. That's probably where I first met him. And then um, he used to come to our gig down in JJ's that we had with Richie and Miles Drennan and, and the guys, you know. And um, he got to know him. But um, yeah, he eventually got around to doing this album anyway. And I don't know how it happened, but I ended up, you know, producing it. And uh, we did it out in Gavin Ralston's studio. Yeah. Great. Gavin Ralston, a fantastic musician. and ma'am <laughs> but um yeah and in that uh we did a few Irish ballad things all right we did uh we did the El Triangle yeah you know sort of jazzified it a bit and um and I played a little solo thing actually on it uh which I I haven't addressed in years so I haven't played so I wouldn't be able to play for you but it was um it was two it was a little medley um Dublin in the rare old times and oh, yeah, just teaching that to some students now. <laughs> in Dublin's fair city. Yeah. In Dublin's fair city. What was that in there? I don't know. Let's see it come in. I remember those harmonizations though, I don't remember the full, but I had a little arrangement of it. You can hear that very uh, extended harmony. Really nice. Um, and that went on the album, which was great, you know. But that's my only thing. Um, I know David O'Rourke, my friend David in New York, uh, did a project with New York musicians and he did our nice tunes and he had, you know, you know some great trap players, that's great. Uh, New York jazz guys uh, like Peter Washington on bass and... Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But it has been done, yeah, a lot of people do that. Uh, so it's coming up to nine. You started a bit late, so we'll finish a little bit later. But oh, yeah, yeah. I'll ask you to play us a tune to finish up tonight. But before that, song. <laughs> if you, yeah. someone requested Bright Song, but if you don't know that, anything to play us out. But just before that, if, you, if anybody wanted to contact you for a lesson or anything like that over the internet, how would they contact you? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'm on Facebook there, you know, you will be Facebook, you cash out, but my email is uh, hughguitar at gmail.com. So we'll put that in the, uh, in the chat there, hughguitar.com, yeah, yeah. contact, email Hugh if you want to have a lesson with him. Yeah, and there's lots of stuff. I mean, I mean, we could do this 20 times and we still have a lot of stuff to do, all right, you know, um, and yeah. uh, yeah. a lot of things I even like to, yeah, you talk about playing and things that people should maybe do when they're starting out playing and you know there's lots of yeah. materials that you should learn because i didn't because i didn't know about it you know yeah well it was all even when i was learning it was like just loads of different way every teacher tell you something different it was all yeah, yeah well that's true yeah yeah and that's confusing in one sense yeah. but uh, i mean things like triads i mean you probably you know you know but things like mm. i didn't know about triads on guitar like triads mm. but they're probably the most important like building blocks in music 
exactly. You know, and for harmony and for soloing and, you know, for everything, yeah? Hear that, students? That's what yeah. I can Like, they really are, because you can use them for soloing, for composition, for accompanying, and um, and just, um, yeah, well, even when I'm studying sort of more complex harmony and stuff, I just say, oh, that's just a triad there, you know? That's yes. just a E major triad with something on it, you know? And this thing. So, yeah, yeah, there's so many nice things you can do. And Which, if people um, want to hear more of your music, where do they go to hear your music? Um, yeah, there is some. I think, the, I think the, um, there's one of my albums, uh, Sketches of Now, which yeah. I think is on YouTube and it's on Spotify. Yeah. If you want to go there. And, um, and that Ronnie Drew album is on Spotify as well. There. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's that called? Um, A Fond Farewell. A Fond Farewell. Yeah, Ronnie Drew, a fun for a while. And it's really nice because it's very intimate. Um, Ronnie wasn't well at the time when he was recording, so we, we, we'd we record every week, once a week. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, it was lovely stuff and it was the stuff he wanted to do for a long time. Yeah, so it was really nice, nice to do that. Um, and that's good stuff to check out, yeah. Sketches right. of Now will be one. Yeah, definitely. Um, cool. Sketch. Yeah, I put that there in the chat window. So you guys check out those things there. So uh, let's finish up with hearing Hugh play us something. I don't know what he's going to play, but thank yeah. you. Really, thank you, Hugh, for, for your time this, this evening and just oh, great. Us these stories and playing. It's, uh, it's really, it's great to hear. It is really great to. Oh, great. Yeah. You know, don't kind of, you hear people playing a lot and you don't know about the background and where people come from and all the experiences that go to make up the way you play really yeah yeah it is true and and yeah that's true I, I mean i think these days a lot of time i like to hear people talk artists just talk about their process myself yeah. that's what i like sometimes as opposed to listening you know to music even you know because that's ultimately that's what it's about trying to do your own thing and you know and find some ways of doing it and how to practice as well which is one of the biggest things for musicians you know how to practice I'm sure you it's one of your things, I'm sure, yeah. But yeah, we could talk about that for an hour easily. Yeah, oh yeah. You talk all day about that, you know. Do you have any like quick tips on uh Well I mean, to... Yeah, I mean the thing is yeah, if they're all things that everybody would have heard, you know, practice slowly. Yeah. and um, there's no doubt about it, like practice slowly. and have a plan. Have some sort of a plan. Because if you don't have a plan, there's no continuity. It's about continuity with something, you know, because we're notorious sort of, we pick up one thing one day and we play it for a while. And then, then the next day we pick up the guitar and jump onto something else and something else the next day. So there's no, we're not really like penetrating any material uh, or not internalizing anything really, you know? Mm. So, so if you have a plan where, you know, you have a little practice plan and probably it's good as well, I think to probably have a short practice plan if you only have half an hour to practice. Yeah. Or 15 minutes wherever it is or if you have two or three hours of practice then have a practice plan for that so so if you're on the run and you only have 15 minutes you know have something that you can practice you know that will help you great great progress yeah is that someone yeah Niall asked is it going to happen again we're going to have a, another guest next week yeah we'll do a few more of these in may we might go to once a month then after that but jake curran is going to be on next week so you know jake oh great yeah so that'll be really interesting. And uh, if you want to hear about what we're doing, may, you can go to the link and join our mailing list. I put it in the chat box there. And if you're interested in our live stream classes of so different levels classes, you can go to the usam.ie forward slash live stream link that I put there in the chat box. So let's let's hear some music now. And Yeah, I'll, I'll try that bright song thing. Um... Okay, brilliant. I'll sort of play a little bit out of time for it, just get in my head.
A bit rough, but uh, I don't normally play it as a solo thing. But yeah, yeah, so uh, that's one of my melodies, actually. I like that melody, actually, myself. It's one of my favorite ones. Great. I was listening to it, actually, the other day on YouTube with uh, oh, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. a good player, Guy. Oh, Guy Barker, yeah. Guy Barker, brilliant. It's great the trumpet and the beautiful arrangement. Nice one. Yeah. Really nice melody. Yeah. Nice. Well, that is it. We're going to say good night lots of comments coming in saying thanks to hugh thanks for amazing playing and really enjoyed it and uh Podrick said he's going to be on a jazz buzz for the next while <laughs> oh great and if, it, if anybody's interested in, you know you know drop me a line and you know is any uh, i think they're curious about i have lots of handout things and someone asked about your book actually uh the guitar guitar chord doctor i put, oh, yeah, a, I have a, book put a link to that yeah <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm like most musicians, you know, terrible at promoting myself or things like that. Yeah, you have a book that has an awful lot of that chord melody stuff in, obviously, right. in that, and lo loads of different chord voicing options and ideas and things like that, you know. Um, Get Hugh's book, everybody. Yeah, I'm always looking for harmonic ideas myself anyway, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I was one I came across the other day, yeah. I might as well, <laughs> you're not going to get rid of me now. Just, just a major scale, actually. And then just playing a chord, starting on any root note, say starting there, and descending. So it's like country motion. So if you can hear this, can you, can you hear that? C major scale, ba da da. So. Nice, isn't it? Nice. It'd be nice, like intro or something in a tune, or, isn't it? It is, it is. That's you have a very simple idea. And you can start on any given note and you get this country motion thing, which is like two lines, like like a bass descending and the melody ascending. <laughs>
so yeah it's really really nice stuff and it's actually simple enough actually you know anyway <laughs> lovely little extra bonus thing there you can have yeah, that yeah. Free at the end of this <laughs> so I'm gonna turn that into a tune and upload the video on facebook and we'll watch it yeah yeah absolutely cool well thank you so much again hugh that was uh, really really enjoyed it and, and thanks to you daniel and you're doing a great job there with the school actually thank you um you're fantastic yeah i have to say it's fantastic vibe there at the school there hoping hoping that everything gets back to half normal again you can yeah, hope so. say hope hello so. anyway. love to uh get back to doing playing together it's a big it's a big you know yeah. we're still teaching away but playing together is is an important part so oh, yeah getting that happening again and oh, yeah. doing more workshops yeah, i can't wait for that to be with me. yeah 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 let's let's get through this with more music and practicing and listening and chatting and doing what we can do in the meantime and we'll get through this yeah. in spirits so uh that's it that's it from us Come back next week for Jake Curran. See you on the internet soon, probably. Thanks a lot. So Bye see everybody. Soon. See everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye. Good night. Thanks a lot.